Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this talk about how to catch the eye of the media today with your important message and how to think like a journalist. So sharing their insights today are Truen Restwick, the founder and CEO of the award-winning charity Hubbub UK that creates environmental campaigns to inspire people to make healthier, greener lifestyle choices. His background is as the founder and CEO of Global Action Plan UK and the head of fundraising for Friends of the Earth. His mission is to revolutionize the way environmental messages are communicated to a mainstream audience. Will Guyatt is head of communications and marketing at Ecotricity, the world's first green energy company, as well as handling marketing, PR, and social initiatives for Forest Green Rovers Football Club, which was dubbed the world's greenest football team by FIFA in 2017. He's held senior positions in communications and social media at businesses such as Facebook, Instagram, News Corp, and broadcasts for uh, he, he broadcasts about technology for LBC Radio in London and the BBC, among others. Our third speaker is Helen Bell, a director at Greenhouse PR, which is a consultancy based here in Bristol that specialises in organisations that want to drive social and environmental change. She was the one responsible for launching the life-size wicker whale that marked Bristol as the UK's first European green capital in 2015. She sees herself as a storyteller, telling the stories that matter to make people aware that positive change is possible and achievable. So, to start us off, would you please welcome Truen Restrick to the podium. Uh, delighted to see so many of you here. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a very, very brief bit of background to Hubbub, uh, the charity I started, um, and then really go on to some very practical examples of how uh, we think you sort of make your, your, your stories news, newsworthy. Um, so first of all, uh, Hubbub, uh, set up uh, four years ago as a charity uh, with the simple aim of trying to get environmental messages out to a mainstream audience. Uh, it was basically a belated midlife crisis on my part. Um, and so I sort of had a set of rules that I thought it would be important uh, to follow for the charity. The first one was don't talk about sustainability because that's not a mainstream conversation. So we talk about things that we think people are interested in, which is the homes they live in, uh, the food they eat, the clothes they wear in their neighborhood. Uh, our second rule was um, you can't do it as a small charity on your own, so you need to collaborate uh, with others. The third th rule was to communicate in as many ways as possible in a fresh and different style, uh, to run campaigns, to independently measure what you achieve, and then give away the results, good, good and bad, so that people can learn from your many mistakes, but also hopefully copy the best bits. And the final rule was, it doesn't matter if nobody's heard of your organization if they're doing the right thing. Um, so those were our principles, that was the business plan. Uh, I had 25,000 pounds to start with, uh, and I thought, right, let's go. Uh, three months in, I had 500 pounds, thought, uh-oh. Um, but, you know, in, in four years, the, the organization's grown, so this year it's got turnover of just over two million, uh, mainly from businesses. So somehow, <coughs> along the way, uh, we sort of got it right. Uh, and I just want to start by the approach we take, because I think this is fundamental to the way we try and get uh, environmental messages out to the mainstream. So we have our four main topics, um, but the way we develop campaigns is, is very sort of simple in many ways. So the first thing we do, say if we want to do something on food waste, uh, is we get real insight and we go and interview people and, and we listen to people and we speak to people. And what we're trying to find out is what's driving behaviours, what are the opportunities and what are the obstacles that are out there. And then we, we take that insight and then we think about all the proven behavior change techniques that exist, you know, from nudge to visualization to gamification. Um, what can we do uh, that will change that behavior using behavior change techniques that are proven? Uh, we then try it and we try it as quickly as we can and as cheaply as we can. So the mantra is learn fast, fail cheap. Um, and from that, pick out the best bits share the results of what we've done, and then take it all to scale. So it's a really simple 
model, but the, the way the model works is we do lots and lots and lots of things very quickly um, to sort of get keep them it in the attention of the media to keep everything fresh and different. So um, an example of that is uh, this bin. I don't know if you've seen it. This is so we went to one street. It was, the challenge was how do you stop people littering in the second busiest pedestrianised street in London? We went onto the street, watched it day and night, which is an intriguing way to see London at four o'clock in the morning on this street called Villiers Street. It's cleaned seven times a day. What we discovered, it was blokes dropping cigarette butts on the street when they were drunk. So how do you stop a piss bloke dropping a cigarette butt was the challenge. Uh, we didn't think a little sticker would quite work. So we basically thought about behavior change techniques, which was nudge. Uh, and then we thought, right, how can we get people to use the bin? So we thought, what are blokes interested in sport, by and large? Um, so the question we asked was, who's the best football player in the world? Is it Ronaldo or Messi? Vote with your cigarette butt. Uh, at the time, it was messy, so we stacked the bin so it looked like Ronaldo was winning because we wanted to provoke the conversation. <laughs> um, Lads Bible took a photo of it. It got shared 76,000 Facebook uh, likes in one day. Uh, I then started getting phone calls from people saying, we love the bin, can we have one? So Sheeple Airport, Rock Stadiums, uh, sort of local authorities. Well, I have one bin, so it's like, this is going to be quite complicated. Um, <laughs> So what we've done is we've created a social enterprise which is owned by the charity. We've sold 1,300 bins uh, around the world. We've had questions like, is Donald Trump's hair real? Uh, <laughs> lots of questions about Brexit. Uh, it's been shared so much by social media. So it's about stopping cigarette littering, boring, but using an intriguing and fun way to do it, interesting. Uh, and that's sort of created a story. It's dropped cigarette littering by around 25%, wherever it's gone, wherever it is in the world, and it generates an income back into the charity. So that's, that's a sort of iteration of that original sort of model. So I just wanted to go through five things that I think any sort of environmental organisation should, should think about in terms of trying to get their message across. So the five things I've come up with are create a really strong story, create a narrative. People love stories. Be topical. What can you do that sort of fits into the zeitgeist? Um, collaborate. You know, the more people you can get telling your message, the better. Be visual and have fun. You know, don't be dour environmentalists telling people how they should live their lives. Uh, and think about what you're trying to achieve, not what's in it for the organisation. So those, those are my sort of five rules. And I just wanted to quickly sort of explain how we've taken those principles uh, and turned them into sort of environmental campaigns. So this is, uh, this is a giant washing machine, obviously. Uh, and the campaign was called What's in My Wash? So we were looking at fashion, and the question we were asking ourselves was how do you <coughs> stop people <coughs> buying loads and loads of clothes which they hardly ever wear and throw them away? So how do you tackle the consumption of, of fast fashion? And basically we've been really struggling with it for, for two or three years because it's quite a hard message. Um, so then we did some more research and we found that, that sort of microplastics uh, which are in our oceans, the biggest cause of microplastics in our oceans is washing clothes. Um, the second biggest is, is car tyres. So you thought, that, oh, that's interesting, that's a topical story. If you wash your clothes, like polyester clothes, nylon clothes, it releases plastics which are getting into our oceans, which is a topic of debate. <coughs> so the campaign we launched was, what's in my wash? You know, what happens when you wash your clothes? Uh, we put a massive installation in, We've done videos, lots of campaigning. We've built our own website. Um, and it's been really interesting to see how this has played out because now people are starting to talk about clothing and microplastics, which they weren't before. Uh, the select committee has just called for evidence on it. Uh, we've been approached by nine of the major retailers uh, to talk about the issue and what they can do about it. Uh, and we've started to host events with British retailers. So that was just an idea of how we took a story approach to, to a big issue and, and sort of brought it to life. And for us, it's then about tackling fast fashion. So buy less clothes, look after the ones you've got, take better care of them. And another story we did was, um, there's been, again, it's around plastics, lots of demonization of plastics. Actually, in some forms, plastic is quite good in terms of like preserving uh, sort of food and keeping food fresh. But also, if you recycle PET bottles, they have a value. So what we wanted to do was say, Plastic has a value if you can keep it within the uh, recycling chain. If it gets into nature, it's a disaster. 
So we collected a load of plastic bottles from a sponsored run in London. Uh, we took them all the way up to Scotland to uh, a company that turned them into planks. They were then returned all the way back to London to this maverick boat builder who built the Queen's Barge. Uh, and he built a punt, a really traditional design boat uh, that can hold about 12 people. We stuck a very expensive electric motor on it. And basically, we're using it to take children plastic fishing. So they go plastic fishing around Docklands in London. They fish out plastics from the water. We take businesses as well. Businesses pay for it, so that means we can take the children for free. Um, and uh, yeah, we've collected enough plastics to build a second boat. So we launched a second boat about two months ago. Uh, we've now got enough for a third boat, and we're going to basically offer it as a national competition. So if, if you're interested in doing plastic fishing trips, look out in, in November. You can have a chance to win a, a week load of fishing trips. And then we're going to give the boat away. So if anybody wants to keep the boat and to use it as an income generator, that will be coming. So being topical. So yeah, we, we're just coming up to Halloween. Uh, 18,000 tonnes of pumpkins are thrown away every Halloween. Um, so we wanted to use this as the hook for a story about food waste. Um, and I think this is, again, how we operate in a nutshell, which is we did one campaign in Oxford called Pumpkin Rescue. Uh, we did a video, we got loads of groups to sort of like create sort of soups from pumpkins that we collected, to share recipes. Um, uh, the media loved it, it was in the sun, the mirror, mail, everywhere. The, the sun headline was simply, <coughs> eat your pumpkin, which I thought summed it up quite nicely. Um, and then we created a how-to guide and then we've given that away. So this is the fifth year of the campaign. Uh, we don't do any media on it now, but it was in The Guardian yesterday, I think it was in The Times the day before. And people just keep doing this. And there are 24 groups all doing their own pumpkin rescue campaigns. So we've just given that away and let people get on with it. Uh, and then similarly, uh, uh, when people go on holiday, we throw away a quarter, a half a billion, sorry, pounds worth of food before we go away. So you plan your trip away, but you don't think what's in your fridge, and then you just throw it out. So the campaign was, would you share food with your neighbors? Um, would you, can you freeze it? Um, and we called it Traveller's Check. We did some Instagrams, some videos, and again, huge coverage in the media, purely because it was topical, it was newsworthy, and it was different. And then my final example of topicality uh, is gift of bundles. So we know that lots of uh, parents in particular have beautiful outgrown baby clothing in their homes. Um, our research discovered that they don't like giving it to charity shops because they have an emotional connection. Uh, with, with that piece of clothing. They've seen their children grow up in it. So what we did, we teamed up with Mother Care, uh, and we got mainly mothers to come together um, to, to create bundles of clothing for a six-month-old girl or a year-old boy. And then they wrote a message on it saying, I remember my child in this clothing. It gives me this memory. I hope you enjoy the piece of clothing too. The bundles were taken to Mother Care, and then on Mother's Day, we gifted them out uh, to local families. Uh, so it was a gift from a mother to another, basically, on Mother's Day. Uh, this year, we redistributed 52,000 pieces of clothing, helped 6,000 families. It's done with mother care. They have more footfall in their stores, which, boy, they need at the moment. But basically, it's an emotional story. It's uh, around Mother's Day uh, about sharing clothing. And then collaboration. So um, sort of lots of conversation about coffee cups. So... We collaborated with businesses to do some coffee cup recycling. So we started off, we put one bin in a street in Manchester. This was the Learn Fast. Uh, what we discovered was that McDonald's have a voucher on their coffee. That voucher is so good that people kept breaking into the bin. Uh, so it's now locked down like Fort Knox. We also discovered that people are more likely to recycle if the bin uh, is bright yellow than if it was white. Um, so we learned a lot, and they're also more likely to recycle it if they see the product come back to their local city. So in uh, Manchester, we provided goods so they could green the city, uh, sort of plant holders and stuff. So we did that in Manchester. We recycled about 30,000 cups. Um, from there, we took it to the heart of London. We recycled 6 million cups in the heart of London. And, and this is a demonstration of how one small campaign can lead to change. Um, so now every, the, every single coffee cup in the UK can be recycled in the UK because the recycling industry has changed. Costa have uh, decided to put £70 per tonne into coffee cup recycling, so it's now economically viable to recycle cups. And then with Starbucks, we did a, a trial, which is what happens... So Starbucks give you 25p discount if you uh, have a reused 
reusable cup. 2% of people took in a reusable cup. So what we wanted to do was like, what happens if you call it a charge? So what happens if you get your 25p discount, but you're given a tax of 5p? 8% um, of people change behavior. So the public were more likely to respond to a 5p tax than a 25p discount. Starbucks sales didn't drop at all. They actually got quite a lot of public, positive publicity. So they've now, from the 36 stores, they've now got it in 930 stores across the UK. They've got a latte levy. Um, the 5Ps that they're charging are donated to us as a charity. It's generating about £140,000 a month. Uh, and we're going to start investing that in more single-use uh, plastic campaigns. And then similarly, we've worked, we brought together 25 huge companies to do a campaign called uh, Leads by Example. Really please that. Uh, fortunately, it's in Leeds, um, and uh, it's, it's basically about trying lots and lots of different techniques uh, to promote recycling on the go, which is a really weak part. We're eating and drinking much more on the go, but there's no recycling infrastructure. So it's basically a six-month experiment uh, to do that. So go and have a look at Leeds, but I won't sort of go on about it, but go and have a look at Leeds, by example. What we've discovered uh, is we've created lots of different things. One of them is a bin. Uh, that you put a bottle in it and it burps and blows bubbles at you. That's way the most popular thing. Uh, everybody wants one. It's quite cheap to do. Uh, but yeah, burping and bubbles is, is really important for communication. And then be really visual. So this is the Forest of Dean. Uh, we wanted to stop littering in the Forest of Dean. We ran a campaign called Love Your Forest because that's what we found that people really uh, connected with. We collected all the litter from the forest in one day. We rented an empty shop, and then we basically created a litter shop, all nicely designed. Uh, so it looked like a normal shop, but it, all it had was litter from the forest from a day. Um, so you could see crisp packets. I think it was 1972 was the, the oldest crisp packet, um, uh, right through to legal high canisters. So it was a way of visualizing, showing uh, the impact of littering, that once you <coughs> drop it, it stays in the environment. Uh, we did community, so there's been research by the University of Newcastle that found if you put a pair of eyes above an honesty box in a coffee shop, uh, the amount of money into the honesty box goes up 20% because people think they're being watched, even though it's a pair of eyes. Uh, the Dutch police did something similar in Rotterdam. They put huge eyes on buildings and crime dropped because people thought they were being watched. They took the eyes away from them and up again. Really <laughs> weird. So we did communities, which are things designed by, by um, uh, local schools, and we put eyes, faces on trees that, that near litter hotspots. And then we've developed something called a trash converter where you could take uh, litter and you get a treat back. So we started with that beautiful Citroen van, uh, which kept breaking down. Uh, so that was bad, but a good idea. So then we thought we wanted to do it, but we want to keep that sort of old-fashioned feel. So we, we converted a horse box, like you do. Um, so that's a horse box, which we take on the Forest of Dean as a trash converter. And this horrifying thing looks like it should be in the thriller video, uh, but is actually... Uh, we found that my, my mountain bikers were littering a lot, so we created uh, this thing, which is on, the, on a bicycle with a very strong anti-littering message, which we take around bicycle rides. And then again, being playful, this is in Brighton, a campaign called Streets Ahead, so it's about littering, stopping plastics getting into the oceans. Uh, so we had sort of lifeguards, sort of Baywatch-style lifeguards who are on the beach, and they'd run after people who are littering. We had steps with messaging. Uh, uh, about stopping people littering, uh, and then we did a big installation over there. And then you can have great fun with hashtags. So, uh, hashtag FFS, which obviously stands for, for fish sake, uh, is <laughs> stop dropping litter in, in the, by the waterways. So, we have a bin, which was like, which is the best side of the river? It's in London, north or south. Uh, we had a cabinet of curiosities, so these are all the things that we found in the river. Uh, this is nudge, so we, over the grates, we put big messages saying, for fish sake, don't st stick things in the grates. And then we set up a fish shop, uh, which we take around places like Borough Market, but instead of giving you fish, it actually sells you plastics from, from, from the water. So everything about driving littering, uh, and again, substantially drop littering all along the, uh, the River Thames, very high footfall areas. And then finally, think about the outcomes. So... Um, Every two weeks, we, we do a video. So there's, if you go to YouTube, there's a Hubbub uh, YouTube site called Hubbub Investigates. Uh, and it's basically about going behind the scenes. It's trying to tell the story about what happens. So, you know, what plastics have I got in my home? What happens to my recycling? 
you know, what can I do about food waste? How can I stop buying shitty uh, Halloween costumes made of plastic and do something differently? It's these sort of videos. So every two weeks uh, we do, do this video. So I've done 71 videos today, 2.3 million views this has uh, already. Um, and we've got about 3,800 subscribers now. So just using video and a different message, it's not about us as an organization, it's about sort of telling the story and investigating. Works incredibly well. And then my final slide about thinking about the outcomes is community fridges. So community fridges are uh, places where perishable food, healthy perishable food is taken from people like sort of Sainsbury's or Morrison's or Pret or perhaps not Pret now, um, or you know, uh, Starbucks. So at the end of the day, they have really high quality perishable food, which needs to be frozen or chilled immediately, otherwise it gets thrown away. So a community fridge is based in a community center, a church or business, um, very local. Food can go into two fridges and a freezer, um, and then it's shared by anybody in the local community. So there's no means testing, it's, it's an open resource to, to cut food waste. Um, so we did some trials, you know, small scale, learn fast, found it worked, created the technique around it. And then again, we've given it away. So, so we've got money for fridges, um, so people can have a fridge for free, we've got how to do it, got all the safety instructions, got all the marketing collateral, and we've just given it away and said, okay, if you want to set up a community fridge, we will help you do it. Uh, we'll give you the fridges to get going. We'll give you all the resource we can. Uh, so 36 fridges are now up and running across the UK. Uh, be 50 by the end of the year. Um, and they're redistributing about half a tonne of food um, uh, every, every month. And the ambition for us is basically to create a community fridge network and then we'll find another charity or another host organisation and just hand it on to them for them to do that so that we can do uh, the sort of experimentation. So, yeah, the outcome is much more important than the organisation on that. So those are sort of my five rules. Um, I hope there's something in there that sort of provoked interest uh, and obviously we'll be happy to take questions at the end. Uh, but thank you for listening. Uh, and uh, now I'll hand you over to Will from uh, Head of Communications at Egypt. I told a mate um, in Dubai about three hours ago I was coming to do this today and he sent me two examples of press releases he received this morning in Dubai. One of them was a company that said they had the fastest defrosting tyre in the world from snow. He's a journalist based in Dubai, one of the hottest countries in the world. <laughs> the second one was uh, a, 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 a press release he received from the, the, the government out there, the, uh, the Crown Prince, saying they've added a new button to their website. That's two press releases that didn't need to exist. Two stories that people thought were worth telling. Everybody in this room is probably judging by you all, and I recently spoke at the Ofgem compliance talk, so I'm glad to say you all look like intelligent people. Intelligent people. I think you all look sensible. We both know neither of those are the right thing to send to a journalist in Dubai, so why did somebody think it was acceptable to do so? Um, and one of the things I've heard so many times in my life is, we think you'll love this. Please, let me be the judge of that. Um, and um, so I've got a slightly interesting um, kind of potted career I started as a journalist, got into communications, I've had roles at places like Instagram and uh, MySpace, believe it or not, that's the one that used to exist, and at Facebook. Um, I'm currently a communications consultant for Lab Bible Group, now the biggest social media video organisation in the world, since it acquired a company called Unilab last week. Um, I also keep my hand in as a journalist, so I work a bit for Al Jazeera, the BBC, and I work for Global Radio, so they've got stations like LBC Heart, Classic FM. So I do a lot of talking, and I also present on the radio too. So uh, I'm a poacher turned gamekeeper, but feel like a bit of poaching, I guess, is probably the, uh, the best way to describe it. Um, I've done this for a long time, and um, that's just three quotes people said recently when I asked them to, to sort of explain what I've managed to do through my career. I kind of got a bit of a different perspective. Uh, my favourite one is Dale Vince, my boss now, saying, is this for a job application, <laughs> when I asked him to sum up what I did. Um, Ecotricity, if you don't know us, we are the world's first... Uh, Green Energy Company. We were founded in 1996 from one wind turbine, founded by one guy called Dale Vince. Um, we've got loads of businesses, loads of uh, operations, loads of different things happening, but the most important thing is our mission is to make a greener Britain by tackling issues in energy, transport and food. And between those, that's 80% of our personal carbon emissions. And if you start tackling those and make some changes, maybe meat-free Mondays, 
think about driving an electric car, you can actually start making some real changes. And the thing that excited me about, enjoy, uh, about joining this business wasn't the fact we own the world's only vegan football club, but it was the fact that we already had about 200,000 customers, energy customers. I wanted to work out how we started getting these messages to 70-year-old daily mail readers like my dad who kind of felt that they wanted to do something better in the world but didn't know how to get there. And it was buying an electric vehicle and coming into contact with the electric highway, which is our electric charging network, that got me in touch with this business. But as you can see there, we've got tons of different things, but anything that we put out into the press is pretty much talking about making a greener Britain, tackling issues in energy, transport, and food. <laughs> that could blow up the congressional map, the Scorsese of Oppo research, and vegans take the pitch. So the reason I showed you that without actually showing you the story is there was a few bits in my life where I was pinching myself there. Obviously, HBO, home of shows like The Sopranos and uh, Wire, um, and this was them in their news show they did, which was 40 million homes across the US, talking about a League Two football club. Many League Two football clubs in England struggle to get coverage in England, but we've managed to tell the story around the world by doing something very different. And to have it in this sort of the lead on their news was one of the most amazing and bizarre moments in my life. And the, mem the number of my friends from California who called me and then said they understood why I left California to come back to the UK was incredible. So. I called this slide the 3.47 a.m. toilet special, and one of my colleagues saw this over my shoulder yesterday and wondered why I called it that, and 3.47 is the time of the day where I get my best ideas, often on the toilet. Um, those headlines there are a couple of things, not all related to ecotricity that I've worked on, some of them I created the idea for, some of them are where we've finally sort of worked out exactly what we're going to do. And uh, the Grand Theft Auto flu, you've probably all heard of the video game Grand Theft Auto. Um, every time it launches, it's like Harry Potter-esque excitement and the country shuts down. So what we decided to do where I was working at the time was ask people if they were planning to take the day off. Believe it or not, loads of people said they'd already booked days holiday or were just going to skive from work and not go to work. And um, we turned that into a global story. Uh, I used to also look after Metal Hammer magazine. Random, but true. Uh, and uh, when we had the last census, or the 2010 census, we decided to get our readers to put heavy metal down as religion. And if you go back to the last census, heavy metal is a bigger religion in the UK than Scientology. As a result of us having fun with it and being creative and encouraging a movement of people, we've all got people that support us, but how do you get the message out to the next group of people? So that was something that we randomly did. And um, we've really traded on FIFA's greenest football club, Forest Green Rovers. The best part about that story is FIFA put it in a video six months before any of us found it and hid it away on their website. But given that it's the FIFA's official YouTube channel, you'd be foolish not to take it, embrace it, and start using it publicly. So from my perspective, as somebody that's been a PR person and a journalist and kind of do a bit of both at the moment, I like different pictures. I like people that bring me something imaginative, some people that bring me stories that aren't the same thing that I've heard everywhere. I definitely don't want to hear from the Dubai Crown Prince with his new button on his website. I like to hear about different things. And in this room, think like a journalist. Imagine what you would want to hear as a journalist. You probably get 100 emails a day from people trying to get their story covered. What is it that's going to be interesting? What can you give people? What is it that you've got? Have you got interesting experts? Have you got access to some really exciting assets? Um, knowledge in journalists is quite often low. They're trying to do too many things these days and trying to work across too many subjects. So the easier you make it, makes it simpler for them to grasp hold of the subject. Guide them through the story. Um, I'm really pleased. Uh, the word zeitgeist has now been used twice this morning. You tap into the zeitgeist. Go for stories. Like for us, Grand Theft Auto was the big release at the time. Get, get into these stories. Do these things. Um, if you're inviting people to an event, uh, like we do with Forest Green Rovers now, we've had media from 39 countries around the world. We've actually got like a proper plan now where we take them to see the robotic lawnmower, we go and talk to them about how the pitch is fed the seaweed, take them into the kitchen to try some food, 
go and do a few bits and pieces, but you plan the experience for the journalists because you're trying to, you're not just hooking them in with a press release, you're trying to tell them the story through everything that you're doing. Don't hide behind quotes as well. The number of times as a journalist, I've had a press release and I've picked up the phone and said, I really want to talk to somebody about this. And I get told, oh, you've got a quote there. I'm like, I'm on a radio station. I'm not going to read out the quote. It doesn't interest me. And um, pick up the phone. You'd be staggered at the number of PRs who do not have direct relationships with journalists and choose to hide behind email. I know journalists can be stressed and sometimes they can be rude if you call them at the wrong time. Much like I did last week when I called the energy editor of the Times when he was dealing with a fracking story and he swore at me and hung up the phone at me. He apologised the day after. It was absolutely fine. But the idea is pick up the phone, talk to people, have direct relationships with them. So Forest Green, <coughs> there's a few bits and pieces that we've done over the last few years. So Dale, the uh, founder of Ecotricity, rescued the club in 2010. Been vegan since 2014, so the players are fed a vegan diet. And uh, if you're a fan and you come to the game, you can't buy a meat pie. We've only got vegan food in the stadium. FIFA named us the uh, world's greenest club in 2017. And we've just been named the world's first carbon neutral club by the UN, which is uh, something that's been a, a real honour and has generated tons more coverage this year. Here are some of the stories we've done in the last year or so. Uh, we were runner-up in football pie of the year, which, because it was a vegan pie, everybody was staggered and thought that was an amazing story. Uh, we had a dispute with our kit, kit supplier, put their logo upside down everywhere around the ground, and it got mentioned on national TV, and loads of people picked up on it. The chairman banned ties from the boardroom. That one wasn't even true, but the press loved it, so we rolled with it. And my favourite one of all, uh, the robo lawnmower makes groundsman's wife see red. Apparently, the groundsman gets texts from the robotic lawnmower when it gets stuck, and it was texting the, the, the groundsman at 2 a.m. in the morning. His partner thought he was having an affair with somebody. It turned out to be the lawnmower. <laughs> and also, one of my favourite ones, bringing it slightly back into reality, we just hired the youngest CEO in professional football, and he's a brilliant guy, and uh, that's generating us tons of coverage at the moment, and he's talking for the club, and these are all not related to our success on the pitch at all. We had a terrible season in the first season in League <laughs> 2 last year, which struggled just about by hook or by crook to stay in the football league, but we had media from all around the world coming to see us. We had 4.2 billion media reach last year. Now, we all know those figures are cobblers, but those are figures that you can pull together from all the data that you've received. Um, you know, we had people like HBO, NHK, Globo in Brazil. Visitors from 39 countries came to see Forest Green Rovers last year. And the year before this, before we started really pushing the environmental messages at Forest Green, we had three sets of media come to our international, come to our media day, media day, and they were the two local newspapers and the local radio station. A year later, we had 35 media organisations come to that day. And that was all just about telling a different story, doing it in a different way. Um, another one, uh, this is going into energy. Um, position your stories carefully. We could have said, we've switched on three new wind turbines near, near, near Bristol, or we could say, is this the last wind farm? Hence the question mark at the end. We weren't telling people it was the last wind farm. We were asking the question, is this the last wind farm? And uh, the idea with this story was, was that we would reflect opinion and wider issues about the government destroying onshore planning. We created a load of broadcast quality assets, and we had a really strong statement of forthright views. And this was the first time we attempted to use social media, not just pitching to the media and the conventional press. We wanted to use our own social media channels. Now, I have an incredible video here to show you, but when we tested it in the, in the run-through, I realised I'd given you a piece of confidential police intelligence, so I had to delete it from the, uh, from the video. It ran, I don't know how I put the wrong video in there, but I was going to show you this wonderful time-lapse video of the construction of these windmills and sort of slowly running in the wind, hot air balloon going over the top of it. It was a really shareable, shareable piece of content. It got over 285,000 views organically on Facebook, 3,000 or more reactions, about 4,000 shares, thousands of comments, and it got picked up in loads of places as well, but partly for the shareable video, but partly because of the fact we were challenging the government over planning rules. Um, the other thing we've got, and one of the things I know Savita had seen, was vegan power. So we've been vetting our energy supply chain since about 2010. In February this year, we said, let's make vegan power a thing. And the idea is we can prove that there are no animal byproducts in our energy, whereas you probably, some of you don't even realise this, but around about 50% of people in the country, their energy companies can use animal byproducts, be that slurry or even dead bits of animal. 
to power your homes. There was a big example a year or so back in Scotland where I think Scottish Power, or SSE, don't sue me if anybody's in the room, one of them bought several tonnes of dead fish from a fish farm uh, and used it to make electricity. And in their annual report, they optimistically called that recycling. And if you're somebody who's into uh, animal rights, that is something that would really, really great with you. So by June 18, we got um, vegan society accreditation for this by proving our supply chain was fully vegan. And essentially, we highlighted an issue most didn't know existed. Lots of you would have seen this advert, and you would have seen it being shared on Facebook. Now, we wanted to kick off the campaign. We paid £26,000 to reach 1.6 million people in the metro. But look at the Facebook reach numbers there. 3.1 million reach on Facebook for that advert. 2.2 million of those we didn't pay a penny for. And we only put 500 quid in to get that 895,000 boost. 6,800 shares, 7,450 comments. I've kind of dealt with quite a lot of advertising standards authority complaints on the basis of this. Lots of angry dairy farmers, thankfully. No complaints upheld yet. Uh, but we've had thousands of sign-ups to our energy business. Vegans, people who've left us, people who really enjoy the ethical stance of what we stand for. Lots of media organisations are posting and, and covering this. And blogs from other energy companies justifying their supply chain stance. So people like uh, Octopus, people like Bol, all saying, yeah, yeah, we've seen the vegan story, but this is why we have possible animal slurry or byproducts in our energy. In this week, we've just had vegan gas accredited. The campaign's kicking off early November. And there is pig gas. So that is uh, pig remnants coming out of your gas supply. Final story for me, um, Dale Vince, our founder, we're currently suing the government for the use of the Union Jack. Um, they have been using the a Green Union Jack for Green GB Week. Uh, we happen to own the trademark for the Green Union Jack and have done since 1999. And Dale's really angry with the fact that the government, the week the government restarts fracking, it tells the world it's the greenest government in the world. So we've gone after the government and we're going to win. And we're going to donate the money, if we win, to an anti-fracking charity. So the government will be making a payment to an anti-fracking charity if we do this. Now, we did this exclusively on Dale's Facebook. We haven't press released this anywhere. Dale's only got 5,600 5, followers on his Facebook, but he does it all himself. So if you read Dale Vince's Facebook, it's him posting, not me or anybody else pretending to be him. It got 400 or more shares. It got 40 comments. And it got featured in a load of national newspapers. And we didn't press release it. We've just got the right people following the Facebook page, and that's become a way of spreading the news. So I'm going to be around after this session if anybody wants to chat, because I realise I've had four coffees and I've spoken really quickly. Um, <laughs> my email address is there. If you want to get hold of me, you can get hold of me on LinkedIn, because that's funny, and at Will Guy, because I need to get my follower numbers up. So thank you, and I'm handing on to Helen now. already. I'm a director in our Bristol office. I'm pleased to be here today. And um, Savita invited me along to give um, an agency perspective on making your programme newsworthy. Um, so our mission at Greenhouse is to use the power of communications to drive um, positive social and environmental change. Uh, this is a mission that I'm sure will resonate with many of you in the room today, but from having worked in PR agencies for the last 20 years, I can tell you that this is something that's very, very refreshing to me um, in the two years that I've been at Greenhouse. We live, breathe and eat this mission, it's fair to say. I've never worked with a more committed team of communicators who are, are so bought into the mission that coming to work is um, something of joy, um, which it sounds hard to believe, but it's, um, we just have a really good time doing what we do. Um, and I'm proud to say that we're actually quite good at it as well. We've won six industry awards so far um, this year already, um, including um, PRCA, named as their ethical champion, um, and Business Green, named as Communications Agency of the Year. And we actually feel incredibly <coughs> privileged to be working with some of the pioneering companies that are accelerating the transition to a low-carbon economy, um, Hubbub included. I launched the Trash Converter um, that Truen showed you earlier. Um, and we focus on the sectors that are really most in need of transformational change. So whether that's food, farming, finance, or fashion, 
um, those are just some of the areas that we're working in. But, I mean, I'm sure many of you will have worked with PR agencies and you, you'll know that it it's, can be a really effective way to, to raise your profile and galvanise action, but of course it's only as effective as the, the brief um, that we start out with. Um, and Savita asked me to, to talk a little bit about what makes a good brief. It might sound really obvious, but I think sometimes clients are a little bit intimidated by the idea that they've got to distill everything they want to achieve into this wonderful piece of paper. And I think it's really important to recognize that the agency can possibly help you in that process. So we developed a template brief that we share very freely with any prospective clients, which not only um, gives you the, the headers um, that should be included, but actually has a whole explanatory section about why and why we're asking for that information. So these are just um, some of the kind of key things that we need to know about. So what do you want to achieve and why? Because ultimately it's quite helpful if we can all decide up front whether a PR campaign really is the best way to go about, or maybe you actually need to do some social advertising. But even if it's just a few bullet points, it really, really helps us to have those communications of objectives up front. Your audiences will probably be determined by those objectives, but again, we can help, we can help you to identify who the right audiences um, should be to achieve your goals. The messages, again, even if it's just a few bullet points, what is it that you're trying to tell people? Um, the timeline's really critical to us. Are there any key events coming up or any particular platforms or launches that we can use? Um, budget, being really upfront about budget and not I mean, so often as an agency, we get told by clients, well, we don't know what the budget is. We'd really like you to tell us what you think it will cost. But if we don't have at least a ballpark within which you're working, then it's almost impossible for us to make recommendations about what's the best uh, course of action. And then, of course, evaluation, which is the big one. What does good look like? What is it you want to achieve? And then we can um, work backwards from that. So just a few things on briefs there. Also, just a few do's and don'ts with working with an agency. Um, so these are just kind of off the top of my head after lots of experience. Do choose wisely. So look at the track record of the agency um, that you're approaching and the relevant expertise, but also team fit. At the end of the day, it's just about people. So the relationship and the chemistry is going to be crucial to, to your success and you know, try and meet face to face. Um, Share your mission. If, you, if we're inspired by what you're trying to achieve, then we're obviously going to go above and beyond to help you achieve your objectives because we're excited for what you're trying to do. Um, collaborate. It works so much better if we can be treated as an extension of your team and work really closely together rather than sometimes you get this slightly combative them and us where you're almost in competition, but it's much nicer to work together. And celebrate success. If it's going well, just say, well done, like it means a lot to get those emails. We get really excited about those emails. Um, the things that I would avoid, don't expect miracles. At the end of the day, we're going to do our absolute best to deliver really fantastic results for you, but let's all be honest at the, at the outset with that brief, with that budget. Don't try and wing it. As I said on the previous slide, if you can spend a bit of time developing a really solid brief and testing it, we're all going to get better outcomes as a result. Try not to set the impossible targets. Front page of FT, are we really going to get it with this story? Let's be kind of honest with each other. And don't be elusive. There's nothing worse than when you have finally convinced a journalist to interview your client, and then they don't answer the phone, and you've got maybe like 10, 15 minutes before that journalist moves on to someone else. So do try and be um, available. And then I just thought it might be helpful, given the title of the session, to try and define what news is. Um, the dictionary definition is newly received or noteworthy information, especially about recent or important events. How often can you say that that is genuinely what you've got in your press release? And can it pass the so what test? That's what we're always asking ourselves in trying to think like journalists. There are, apparently, I discovered through the power of Google, seven pillars that define whether something is newsworthy. So this is quite a good test um, to, to apply to your stories. The important one is impact, of course. Does it, is it going to impact on people? What's the significance? Um, timely, I mean, I think I could say zeitgeist and then it's three times, but is it actually <laughs> going to be um, relevant 
um, to what's going on in the news agenda at the moment. Um, location's obviously important because ultimately it's going to be of much more interest to people where it's happening. So let's think about who the media are in the relevant patch. Um, does it have human interest at its heart? Because as we all know, the best stories always do. Is there any conflict? Hopefully not, but you never know. If you're going to be suing the government, then a bit of conflict goes a long way. Is it just flat out bizarre and weird and therefore funny? Because that's going to be good for social. And is there anyone famous involved? Because sadly, that's still what cuts it a lot of the time um, when securing coverage. So then just to close, I was, um, like Truett, going to just take you through a couple of practical examples of campaigns that we've worked on at Greenhouse that haven't necessarily had the strongest news hook, but what we've tried to do is package them in such a way that they appeal um, to the media that we're contacting. So very pleased to say that the in this case, the client's in the room, so I'll obviously try extra hard to do a good job of selling this one back. But we were very delighted to be um, commissioned by the Woodland Trust um, in April this year to um, launch a campaign called Talking Trees. Um, in fact, Savita was, was very closely involved in this one because we launched at the Festival of Nature. Um, this was a really exciting campaign for us. Myself and, and Jenny worked on it. We learned so much about urban trees. I can't tell you how many fascinating facts there were about trees, and we were just very, very passionate about this particular campaign. But there wasn't necessarily a, a particular hook when we first got chatting. We had this opportunity at the Festival of Nature, and we had the fact that funding had actually been cut, and therefore we were needing to engender a sense of personal responsibility in citizens of Bristol to care more about trees. And all of this with the backdrop, of course, of the... Um, the, the tree cutting in Sheffield that was very topical at that time. So that was our, our challenge. What we were able to do in order to, to kind of create that news hook was to focus on a target which was in the one city plan that hadn't been publicised yet. Um, and we had a little bit of a challenge in that the, the council weren't terribly keen to publicise it. But we knew as soon as we heard the target to double Bristol's <coughs> canopy cover by 2050, we knew that that would give us the story we needed um, and, in fact, um, Catherine was instrumental in persuading her partners to let us use that as our, as our key hook. Um, we also um, focused on generating user-generated content um, by creating the uh, concept of the, the tree selfie. So we were inviting people across the city to take a photo of themselves with their favourite urban tree and really celebrate the idea that these trees that we perhaps take for granted are actually contributing so much to our daily lives. Um, and we managed to, to secure over 200 um, tree selfies um, and lots and lots of coverage, which I'm sure I'll have a beautiful montage. There we go. So there's some of our, our tree selfies. Um, as you'll see, we also persuaded um, some rather wonderful Bristol celebrities to get involved um, free of charge. So that also helped to tick that celebrity uh, bubble from the previous slide. The second one I wanted to talk to you about was a campaign that we did over the summer. This was for NaturaCare, who produce um, plastic-free sanitary products. Um, now, NaturaCare really wanted to, to jump on the back of all the anti-plastic um, campaigning that was going on, because they've actually been at the forefront of this movement for decades, but haven't got a particularly high public profile. So it seemed only right that they had their moment in the sun. And we wanted to do something to hook onto the fact that it was plastic-free July, um, once again, we didn't have a particularly strong news hook. We'd been promised some new data that unfortunately um, was not forthcoming at the 11th hour. So we had to create our own news hook again, and we, this time we did it by organising um, a plastic-free period protest march. Um, and we did that in Brighton, um, simply because it was uh, convenient for, for attracting some, some camera crews along. Um, and we had Susie Hewson, who founded Natural Care, was, was quite pivotal to that, and we got lots of people along. And at the end of the day, what mattered in that scenario was less really about the numbers of people that took part in the march, but creating the idea that there was a march as a hook for the media that we then pitched to, so that it was timely, um, and that was very successful. Um, again, over 40 pieces of coverage, including some really fantastic shareable um, digital coverage on, on the pool, 
um, and in Huffington Post that we were particularly proud of. And we're going to be working with them again um, in the coming months on a campaign that's um, hooked onto the issue of um, female incontinence. So once again, a, a nice topical issue to get involved with. That's some of the coverage. And then the final one um, is a campaign that we've actually just been working on in these last few weeks. So we work with an organisation called the uh, Stockwood Community Benefit Society. Um, and they have a really interesting business model. Um, they're essentially a, a farming family um, who've sold the farm to the community trust that they created in order to ensure that that land is protected for future generations, regardless of what they decide to do in the future. And they launched a new share offer. They need to raise more money. They need more investors. Again, not desperately interesting because there are new share offers launched literally every day and usually for far higher values than the ones that we were dealing with. But actually what we discovered was that Good Money Week, which is a thing in October, Good Money Week was focusing on women um, this year and about female investors. So we were able to hook our story onto the fact that it's a 77-year-old female farmer that sits at the head of this community benefit um, society and make that the story. And therefore, we were able to generate lots of fabulous coverage, including um, a full page in last week's Sunday Times, which I brought because we were so pleased with it. Um, and those are just a few. We have many, many other examples. And as, as the, uh, the others said, very happy to take questions in this next section. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to um, Truin, Helen and Will. Um, I've been frantically writing notes because an awful lot of that chimes with me as a journalist. Um, so I know you're probably going to have loads and loads of questions. But just before we go into questions, um, we've got a spotlight moment where I'd like to introduce Nick Upton, who's a freelance wildlife and conservation photographer who wants to talk to you for a short while. Yes, I'll make it brief. Yeah, just that's a lovely imagination that Hubbard brings, and Will, Will expresses it quite funny and really good pragmatic advice from Helen there. But I just want to stress how getting good photos and video clips can really get your stories noticed and published, get editors to sit and say, yeah, I'd like to know more about that. So um, uh, both online and in print media. So I would say this, but um, if you hire or collaborate with a um, professional photographer, it can really help. Um, you know, we tend to come with a lot of experience, a lot more kit than just an iPhone, as in three cameras and loads of good stuff. Um, so I'm a biologist by training, I've worked in wildlife TV for 25 years. For the last six years I've concentrated on documenting wildlife conservation projects, uh, mostly still partly video, showing people at work, not just the animals, but getting good, good shots of animals. And I get a lot published, you know, for example, um, my photos have illustrated 10 feature articles in BBC Wildlife magazine in the last four years. So I think it's a record. You know, I've come with storytelling uh, um, pictures that tell stories. Um, I've had lots of um, articles in newspapers. Very pleased. I've had positive articles about beavers in the mail. Will father might even have seen that. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, uh, um, I've just done a nice shoot for Wessex Water about a a dog that's been trained up to sniff out newt. So, great story, but a few nice pictures. They were really surprised by the nationwide coverage they got with that by hiring me to get a few nice shots. I think that, that helped. Um, so, in recently I worked for the National Trust, the Wildlife Trust. They use lots of shots in their comms on the websites and all sorts in their campaigns. So, just like I say, if anybody's got projects that they think, whether internal or trying to get out to media, that might need stills or video, Please think about talking to me or people like me. I've got an advert in the back of the um, uh, back of this issue. I'll be around the rest of the day. Um, so yeah, think visual to tell your stories. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, I certainly, from an image point of view, I can endorse what Nick was saying. That I get an awful lot of press releases sent to me with one very dodgy picture that's not print quality, and that nothing kills a story deader than not having a good visual. So it is very important, however you acquire them, but it is very important. Um, right, um, as I say, lots and lots of things that came up in the talk, far too many for me to uh, address all in one go. Um, I was interested by Truen's point about 
targeting the message and meeting people face to face and doing interviews and really finding out who your audience is because Another thing that happens a lot in my work is that we get press releases that are not relevant to us at all. My, my favorite example is somebody trying to get me to endorse their baby clothes in a wildlife magazine, which is very strange. Um, so I just wondered, um, from all of your points of view, is it face-to-face -face or is it um, a sort of a really deep knowledge of your, the demographics of your target audience that's important? So is it personal contact or is it just you, you as an organization must know who you're aiming at? Uh, for us, ideally it's personal contact um, because people always lie about their behaviors. So nobody ever wastes food if you ask them. Nobody ever throws away litter. It just miraculously appears. Um, so for us, it's, it's, to go, it's just to listen. And you know, we, we now know that if we go and we pay people, pay them sort of 20 pounds in a box of chocolates, box of chocolates does every time, and we just go and listen to them for 30 minutes. Um, we don't go with a preset agenda, we're just trying to find out what it is that concerns them, what matters to them. And that helps us to, to shape our campaigns. That's, that's how we develop the campaigns where we can. Um, in terms of media, what we always find works in trying to create a news hook is polling. So you can do polling of sort of 2,000 people, probably cost you in a region of one and a half, two and a half thousand pounds. Um, and if you do that well, you actually create your own news hook. So you can say 70% of people think this, 60% of people think that. So like the plastics one, we wanted to know, did people know their clothes contributed to plastic pollution? Obviously most people didn't. So that was the headline. Um, so I think in terms of our projects, it's very much learn as much as you can as intimately as possible. For the media, it's trying to think about how you can create your own news hook. Um, something that Will was saying about um, press releases and relevance, and one of my bugbears is how I'm greeted in a press release. Um, I, I almost instantly close down a press release that starts off with, Hey Sheena, how are you today? It just is great. So I just would, um, was interested in some insight from you about how you think the best approach is to um, the, the first sentence of a press release, which I think is your greatest opportunity to hook in your journalist. Uh, there's two answers to that in that I'm sorry that when people say hello to you, that frustrates you massively. But <laughs> It's not hello, it's hey. It's yeah. the, hey, but, high five. But that's <laughs> predominantly how most 25-year-olds address each other. So yeah, maybe most we journalists have to, aren't. Yeah, but maybe we have to cut the 25-year-olds some slack in order to do that. <laughs> but what I would say is it's all too easy to waste the 20 seconds of your attention that we have. If you start talking about the brand and this and the launch event, going straight with the facts, we're launching this, we want to talk to you first about it, if that's the case. Are you interested in this? Here's my number. The number of times as a journalist working for radio, and bearing in mind most of my stories if I'm doing it for radio, are about 30 seconds long, unless I'm doing something on LBC. Uh, in the time I've read what you're trying to pitch to me, I've more than doubled the time I have on air to talk about your story. I'm probably not interested in it. But in terms of how I'm addressed, that if anybody writes, hi, Guy, because my name's Will Guy, the number of people who get my name wrong, I'll always reply by calling them a different name. That's how I get through the day, if I get that mistake. But I don't get angry by the introduction of the email, but what I do get angry about is by people assuming we're going to cover the story or completely getting it wrong. And for example, you have the people wanting to dress animals in children's clothing. Um, the number of times I've been asked to cover things that have no relevance to me, and if you've researched what I do, the, the tendency of agencies now increasing, and I'm sure Greenhouse are not one, is to carpet bomb, just get a contact list, and just email everything to that same contact list without thinking about who you're talking to. Develop some personal relationships with journalists. Yeah. I would second your point on the, the cover emails are critical. Quite often what we've got in a press release is what the client wants to say, not what the journalist wants to hear. So our pitch email actually becomes more important often than the press release that's attached, because <coughs> there we do have the freedom to put the story up front and actually just a few bullet points to try and get the attention. So I always agree with that. 
Um, right, would anybody in the audience like to uh, 